Technology and Audiology. We have a wonderfully large turnout again, and I think I see the numbers continuing to increase, so that's lovely. Um, we're talking today about remote pediatric care, and we came up with that topic based on input and questions that we received from you. Uh, and we've got a packed schedule, and I want to thank Anne-Marie Dickinson for putting together this really um, interesting webinar plan. So what's going to happen is, is, first of all, we're going to hear from Sam Lear, Kelly Hugel, Ed Brown, and Veronica Kennedy, and they're going to be sharing some of their experiences with remote pediatric care. This will be followed by presentations from Jane Bevan and Sarah Hodgson. And what they'll do is they'll share some remote care pediatric pathways. Uh, Dawn Bramman will then chime in with some ideas that you can use uh, with your remote pediatric care. And then finally, uh, Amber Ruffley from ManCAD and Bavisha Palmer from UCL are going to present some research data um, that they and their colleagues have collected from surveys about practice changes and attitudes towards remote care. Um, I just want to also add that Anissa is from, from uh, ManCAD is after we finish, because we haven't got time, she's going to record some information and demos about tools and apps that are available for remote care. Uh, we will put those, that, those recordings onto the um, BAA website. So um, without further ado, we've got a lot to cover. I'm going to hand you over to Sam Leah and she Great. will I'm just, begin. I'm just... Thank you, Gabby. Um, just to clarify that we, do, we are doing a little bit of adult today, just things that were specifically requested when we did the survey. So the bone anchored hearing devices is adults and the in, and Dawn section on in situ audiometry is adults as well. But a lot of it's going to be paediatrics. And there's an awful lot. So Sam's going to be first. Can, can you just say hello, Sam? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, super. Hang on, bear with me a second. Oh. Just bear with me a moment. I'm just trying to get the screen to. Oh, there we go. There we go. Can you see your slides, Sam? Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, ladies. I can, yes. Thank you. Um, so I've just been asked to quickly share our experiences of remote working at Sheffield Children's Hospital. Um, unlike some of the people who are going to be speaking, we haven't had access to appropriate video apps for consultation. So we've been largely doing remote working by telephone. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that's what a lot of people are doing, as we've had a bit of feedback from the last webinar that said lots of trusts were having problems with IT and didn't have access to video. Um, but like everyone else, our department essentially shut down to all but urgent patients in March. And since then, we've just been doing the best we can with what we have in the current situation. So next slide. Thank you. Um, so for the hearing aid service, we have been able to do some quite useful remote working. Uh, for new referrals for conductive hearing aid, uh, hearing losses, for mild losses, this has mostly been phoning the families and reassuring them that at home the child isn't going to be at too much of a disadvantage and giving them listening tactics. Um, and then we're replacing these on a review list for face-to-face -face appointments if we can. And obviously, we'll follow them up again with telephone calls if we're still in this situation. Um, back to my other slide, if you can. Um, can you go back a slide? Thank you. We have fitted um, several new significant sensory neural hearing losses. So some we've had to bring in because we've um, decided they are urgent, but also <laughs> let's keep in her but also we have done a couple of fittings remotely so these are where the child was itself was shielding so for one appointment we brought the parent in demonstrated to the parent how to fit an aid how to use an aid and then sent them off to fit the child obviously with close telephone follow-up and input from teacher the deaf and for the second child we've had to just post out hearing aids for the family to fit there were a family with quite a few deaf siblings with hearing aids so they're very experienced and then we've monitored this with phone calls and teach the deaf input for our existing hearing aid users we have been able to do quite a lot in phone appointments that we normally do in review appointments so we're able to to update the history, review the hearing aid use, identify the family's needs. And we've been doing questionnaires where appropriate. I think in particular, the little ears is useful for infants to try and identify how much the child is using their hearing. And this has helped us identify the ones that are going to be a priority to bring in face-to-face um, -face appointments. Um, like many of you 
we now scan all our impressions so it's been quite easy to request remakes for children just requesting two or three percent increase in size for most of these this has been good to sort of eke out ear molds for a little bit longer there have been a few where the child's had a growth spurt and hasn't fitted and we have taken a few impressions recently in clinic where we've decided it's urgent um I would say for PPE, because a lot of people are asking about PPE, each trust has got their own guidance. So there is the professional guidance, but each trust will be have its own strict guidance. For our trust, it's surgical mask, full visor, gloves and apron if you're within two metres of the, the patient. Um, we've posted home a few bone conductor hearing aids, and um, this is sort of not ideal, but it's gone OK for a few patients. We use contact minis. Obviously, it doesn't always fit the child's head. And so, like most of you, we're looking at all the different bone conduction options. Uh, we also run um, with a teacher the deaf a play group for infants with hearing aids. So we had a Zoom um, little ear session yesterday, and that went really, really well. So what I think has worked well for us, I will, I'll, I'll first of all be really honest and say that remote working hasn't worked well for everybody. Quite a few of our staff have found it difficult and some of the families don't find it satisfying. But I think for hearing aids, it has been useful for what we can do. For prioritising new referrals and looking at our waiting list and deciding who we're going to bring in, it's been particularly, phone, um, phone appointment calls have been particularly useful. And I've found it particularly helpful for the children who you're not doing testing, the sort of softer, more counselling side of audiology. So they've all the families have been keen to give this a go. Um, and I've generally asked the parent if they'll put the phone on speakerphone so that the child can join in. Sometimes it's taken quite a while before a child child's confident to join in, um, and sometimes they point blank refuse. Most of this group will have already been seen and had their ears examined and had PTA and TIMPS and we've ruled out red flags. So we do get a lot of referrals for APD diagnosis. So if on a phone call, we've been sending out chaps questionnaires to get the parents view of the difficulties, but it's quite good to um, remotely um, talking to people. You can advise them we wouldn't actually be diagnosing APD as such anyway, but identifying the listening difficulties and you can do your full counselling about their difficulties, give them tactics to help, which is generally what most parents want. And we can still write a letter with advice for school, which is the main thing people want to take away. And quite a few families have been reassured by this and happy to be discharged. And similarly with tinnitus, um, because they'll have already been tested and, and red flags ruled out, um, I've been able to use a tinnitus rating scale to sort of talk about how bothersome the tinnitus is, give a lot of reassurance and information about how common tinnitus is in children, do a lot of counselling about sound enrichment, etc. And so I think we'll continue to follow these up by telephone or video app even after uh, lockdown's finished, because I've had good feedback about these oh, last slide so like most of you will be restarting clinical activity um, but it's not not going to be safe to return to normal levels so we'll be looking at patients from a priority list first um, we've had to think of things like staggering clinics having a lot of patients working from home on a rosa basis so that we keep the absolute minimum of people in the waiting room at any time but what we're going to be doing now is having a kind of a buddy system where a member of staff working from home will phone for a remote appointment prior to the face-to-face -face appointment, take a full history, and in particular explain to the child and family what's going to happen when they come into clinic. I think one of the things we're going to try and get across if the child is, is going to be uncooperative or kick off that we might be limited to how long we can continue trying to test and it might not even be appropriate for the to bring them in and then when we do have a face-to-face -face clinic staff will be able to concentrate purely on testing and I think as well if a lengthy discussion is required afterwards about results this is going to be offered remotely on the phone or as I said we're getting the attend anywhere software rolled out anytime soon um, that's about all I wanted to say because um, it was just a very quick look into what we've been doing but as I said it 
it's been kind of mixed. Not all remote working has been successful. We've done what we can, but obviously some of it will carry on. We'll continue to triage referrals definitely by phone, but obviously then we'll have to be aware of our six week wait. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about others' experience with video appointments, because as I said, we're going to be getting the Attend Anywhere software ourselves. That's Brilliant, John, thank to you. Say. Brilliant, so you definitely will hear more about that during thank today. You. Um, Any particular and, questions? I've just been looking on the questions to see if anything's cropped up. Nothing has at the moment, Sam, but I'm going to keep a track of them. And if anything specific to you comes up, then we can have a look at that. Um, we'll definitely put all the questions together Brilliant. and answers online afterwards as well. So have we got Kelly on, on yeah. the line? Super. So Kelly's team actually volunteered or suggested today's topic and then they volunteered immediately to help with it. So thank you very much to Kelly and all the team from East Kent and they're going to talk about what they're doing at the moment. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, yes, as Anne-Marie said, we were quite keen to touch base with everyone, hear what other paediatric services were doing um, under these very sort of uncertain times. Um, I'm one of the team members at East Kent Children's Hearing. Um, we are a community-based paediatric audiology service covering East Kent. Uh, we work at two acute hospitals and two clinic-based um, sites. Um, our team consists of three senior audiologists, uh, two assistants and an audio vestibular physician. So we are quite a small team. Um, currently, we're managing the PCHI caseload um, and provide audiology cover for um, ENT for the under three population and provide hearing assessments uh, for referrals from multiple professionals, including GPs, pediatricians, speech and language therapists and uh, health visitors. Um, so on the slide, this is just basically what we've been providing um, since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, obviously, hearing aid repairs and consumables have been sent out uh, via post, working, working remotely in that aspect. Um, urgent hearing tests for bacterial meningitis, um, oncology patients and sudden um, loss of hearing has obviously continued. Um, new ear moulds, um, unfortunately, our service um, has only recently started the ear mould uh, scanning digital scanning. Um, so for now, what we've been encouraging parents to do um, is to post off an old uh, set of ear molds to our manufacturer, who has then been um, double dipping or um, kind of making making the sizes larger um, for a new set of ear molds, which has been particularly helpful for our younger hearing aid users who obviously rely on, on frequent ear molds. Um, we have been conducting a few emergency impression appointments, but I will take you through how we've been doing those appointments later on in the presentation. Um, our PCHI caseload um, has been receiving telephone consultations. Um, and as audiologists, we have been doing some telephone triage for our tier two clinic uh, referrals, which I'm going to go into more detail um, later on in the presentation. Um, our NHSP diagnostic uh, service is provided by our acute colleagues. Um, and obviously, if hearing loss is identified, we've been continuing to support in that area. Um, and we've also had two of our staff members be uh, redeployed to the newborn um, hearing screening team, which has definitely helped in terms of capacity um, and I think keeping referral rates down on that side of things. If we can go, thank you. Uh, just in terms of um, our telephone referral um, triage, as I mentioned, our tier two clinics, as audiologists, we've been doing a triage process. Um, normally we'd see um, hearing uh, test appointments happening six weeks after referral, but obviously during the pandemic, our waiting lists have been growing. Um, as a team, we obviously discussed that in some instances, hearing tests may no longer be required. Um, obviously for cases of temporary glue ear, which may have resolved, um, developmental speech and language, um, which may have improved uh, since the referral was made. We thought that there might be an opportunity for discussion with parents to kind of get a sense of what their concerns are and whether those appointments were, were still needed. Um, so we've been having these collaborative discussions with families. We've been using a questionnaire to help us sort of guide these conversations, which I'm going to go into more detail on uh, later on. Um, but basically, it's given us a good tool to sort of verify um, kind of what the concerns are and, and ensure that as audiologists having these conversations, we have a level of continuity between all three of us um, when we are phoning families. Um, it's been good to get a sense of who requires a priority appointment versus a routine appointment so that when our clinics do kick off and get started again, we can ensure that those who require priority testing are seen first. 
Um, just to make mention before I go on to the questionnaire, um, one of the questions uh, that we had sort of raised is, um, is this triage being used to obviously discharge children? Um, our questionnaire is not used as a tool to discharge children necessarily, because obviously it's, it's a questionnaire, it's a discussion we're having with the family, and we still have no way of verifying hearing levels um, based on the questionnaire. So really the questionnaire should just be used more as a tool to kind of guide that discussion and to sort of understand where the concerns are. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so here's an example of um, the questionnaire that we developed for our older cohort. So that's the four to 16 year old age group. Um, I haven't popped any references on these slides. If anyone is interested, um, just in terms of how we kind of put these questions together, um, we did reference uh, several sort of standardized questionnaires that are out there at the moment, like the little ears and peach. Um, the infant toddler meaningful auditory integration scale, um, NDCS tools, um, as well as having some collaborative discussions with our speech and language uh, therapy team, just in terms of what screening tools they use, especially in the sort of younger age group to gauge um, what they'd expect at certain ages. Um, so this is the questionnaire we've, we've been doing with the older sort of children. Um, we believe that when our appointments do kick off again, uh, this is going to be the age group we're going to start testing. Um, we're very lucky in our service. We do have um, soundproof booths with a separate observation um, room um, at all of our sites. So in terms of testing, we think this will be the most uh, sort of straightforward age group to start uh, testing due to the ability to use Talk Forward um, and, and conduct tests in, in that way. Can you go to the next slide, please? Right, so this is our, obviously our youngest age group. Here are just some examples of the questions that we have been sort of posing to parents. Um, in terms of VRA for the younger age group, we are particularly interested to hear what people's feelings are um, in terms of working towards the new normal in VRA clinics. Um, we are obviously quite concerned about aspects in terms of infection control and um, that sort of thing in terms of practically conducting these clinics. Um, in the eight months to one year age group, we think it will likely be quite easy. Obviously, the younger the child, the easier it is for them to stay seated on their parents' lap during the VRA. Um, however, the more kind of toddler age groups may need more, um, more help from the distractor in those, in those instances. Um, so really interested to hear where people's thoughts are about conducting those clinics um, moving forward. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Just an example here, one uh, year to two year age group, some of the questions um, that we'd be asking parents. Um, just gives you a good idea sort of where the speech and language is at that age as well. Um, obviously, one of the, the largest sort of uh, percentages of referrals we receive at this age has to do with speech development. So um, we thought that would be helpful to discuss with parents. Um, the next slide, please. And just once again, this is for two to three year olds. Um, if anyone does want any more information about these questionnaires, or as I said, the references for where we, we um, got the question from, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. We'd be happy to share those. All right, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we are conducting some emergency um, impressions face to face. Um, like um, other services, we haven't had the go-ahead for face-to-face -face appointments. We don't have a definitive date yet as to when those can occur. However, we understand that there are cases where moulds may be completely missing um, and there'd be really no way of, of, um, of getting a new one um, made unless an impression appointment occurred. So um, our criteria for these at the moment are for bilateral, moderate or greater hearing loss. Um, and obviously if the ear molds are, are completely missing. Um, we've conducted a few of these appointments, obviously prior to the appointment, doing the COVID screen, checking um, that the um, patient and family member are asymptomatic, um, conducting a temperature check at the time of the appointment. Um, we have encouraged uh, parent and child to wear a mask. However, PPE does differ between trusts, um, but that's been our approach so far. Um, we're also really lucky here down south. We've had amazing weather over the last few months, so we've been lucky enough to conduct these outside um, in the garden at our clinic site, um, which I think has been quite enjoyable for audiologist and child. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of our criteria for those at the moment. Um, just to wrap up, looking at clinics moving forward, um, these are just some of the things that we, we think will likely be implemented kind of under the new normal of our 
um, clinic operation. Um, a lot of these have obviously been mentioned um, on the BAA Facebook group. There's been discussion about these in previous webinars as well. Um, obviously, we've got um, some virtual um, opportunities in terms of our transition uh, cohort. We use uh, the Ready, Steady, Go program, which is um, a series of questionnaires that are designed to take a child through transition, which we can continue to conduct on a virtual platform. Um, and we have had quite a lot of success with that program over the last few years. Um, in terms of some of our clinics, we do have a multidisciplinary approach with some of our hearing aid users where um, uh, teachers of the deaf and speech and language therapists are often on site uh, for those appointments. Those will obviously be moving to a more virtual sort of platform. Um, but just in terms of the way forward, we were just really keen today to hear what other people's uh, solutions were to um, working in clinic, particularly in terms of testing and how we see see that moving forward but I think um, if anyone has any questions please feel free to to get in touch with us and likewise if they require any resources just to let us know thank you that's great Kelly thanks because we have actually had a request whether you'd be prepared to share your questionnaires and whether somebody yeah. could get in touch with you so I think you probably will yeah. get people contacting you that's lovely thank you um, so next we've got Ed who's going to talk about his service are you there Ed hello is that there? I did speak to him earlier. Do I know potentially he's there? Maybe we'll come back to you, Ed. He's just so like muted, muted at the moment. <laughs> Is he muted? Yeah. yeah. I have been got... muted. Oh. Great, you, you there, me, Ed? Man? Yes, can you hear me? Can. Yes. Right. <laughs> OK, um, I'm just going to give a quick run through of uh, where we are uh, in terms of, of what we've done. There's not going to be any huge rocket science here. I just wanted to give um, a kind of honest over uh, appraisal overview uh, of what we've done, what's worked and yeah, what we still need to do, because I'm, I'm really conscious that um, services around the country are, are moving at different speeds in terms of trying to get back to normality. And a lot of it isn't actually within the gift of audiology, it's, it's down to sort of trust uh, decisions, for example. So just a quick history. Um, so first of all, a, a lot of what we're able to do is governed by um, the, the clinical advisory group of the trust or organization or whatever um, the, the equivalent might be in your own organization. Um, here, uh, all routine activity was canceled from the 23rd of March. Um, having said that, I decided on the Friday before um, that I couldn't actually wait for them to make the decision uh, and I didn't want to have Hayley and her admin team rushing around trying to cancel 400 patients on Monday morning. So as a, as a head of department, I elected to actually cancel it um, prior to the trust actually formally saying uh, cancel activity and, and it turned out to be a, a sensible move. So a lot of what we were able to do since then has been guarded by the clinical advisory group. So we, we were authorised to continue to see screen contraindicated uh, newborn referrals, bilateral referrals and post meningitic and sudden hearing loss. Uh, and we got that approval on, on the 1st of April. Within that, we did also include urgent um, pre-school hearing aid provision as well. So yeah, for example, we've had one or two new hearing aid um, fittings from the, the newborn screen and some urgent repair uh, or review work. We were able to do that from, from the off. Uh, on the 7th of May, we were then able to get um, authorization to see unilateral referrals as well, and also to restart the, the newborn screening recall clinics, which had been suspended. Um, with the guidance from PHE uh, NHS England on the 2nd of April. I, I, I mean, just one thing to say, I mean, you know, you can actually spend quite a lot of time and effort getting stuff through clinical advisory groups. So you, you, you do have to be prepared to put the, the time in there and to, to make your case. Um, and you know, it's, it is important that we do follow the correct channels and, and you know, we make sure that we are following good science and good clinical practice through most of march and sorry can you just go back one slide quickly 
uh, through most of March and April, 70% um, of uh, time for staff, uh, they were based at home and we used synchronised um, practice navigator laptops um, to enable us to continue working productively. That was primarily for um, uh, adult patients uh, because we're an all age uh, service. We're now operating on the basis uh, of uh, staff being based at home 50%, once again undertaking remote, uh, uh, remote access work. We were lucky, um, none of our staff were redeployed. Um, we did offer, but we, we weren't redeployed, but we did uh, support the trust in assembling Pfizer kits. Next slide. So just a bit about newborn hearing screening, because I'm the, the local director of the programme across Sunderland, South Tyneside and Gateshead. So we, we cover 6,800 births, three maternity facilities, two trusts. Um, at the time this all started, our, our newborn screening manager was on long-term sick. We had another screener on long-term sick, uh, and one of our screeners needed to go into 12-week um, shielding. So it, it wasn't the best timing of events. We did train two audiology staff up to help with screen capacity, but actually, you know, they weren't required. Um, but we do still do have uh, that. Uh, resource if there is uh, a second way, for example. Hospital-based screening continued as normal all the way through. As I said, I've already mentioned, you know, there was a letter from Public Health England about community services, which was a little bit confusing. There, was a num there were a number of versions of it, and certainly in one version, two paragraphs about newborn screening seemed to contraindicate, uh, uh, sorry, contradict themselves. But certainly the initial um, advice was to suspend those uh, community clinics and as I said we managed to get authorization to restart those uh, on the 7th of May. So at the peak we had a backlog of 182 screens, we ran additional recall clinics at additional off-site facilities, you know, we did telephone liaison, we escorted um, parents directly from the car into the facility so they weren't having to wait uh, in waiting areas. The, that backlog is, is currently down to 64 and we expect that to be cleared by the end of June um, and that's uh, excluding any declines. Next slide please. Uh, just very quickly, yeah, th this is just the referrals to uh, one of our audiology facilities from the newborn hearing screen and you know, we did, I, I guess a lot of people uh, had the same, we did actually get a spike in March and April uh, and that probably reflected um, the fact that um, in some cases, you know, babies might have been referred directly to audiology. Also, there was a change in guidance from, you know, going from uh, OAE1 straight to ABR. So we did have a, a bit of a spike there, uh, but that's that's come back down to where we'd expect it to be. Next slide, please. So in terms of diagnostics, at the, the peak, we, we had a backlog of 27 cases. Uh, we were pretty much able to continue to see um, the bilaterals, screen contraindicated, um, post you know, all the way through uh, from the outset. Uh, when we did see them, you know, it was with uh, reduced throughput. So, um, you know, just one uh, baby per session with the uh, appropriate PPE, which I'll talk about uh, in a slide or two. So we also had authorization to uh, then start the uh, seeing the unilaterals in the 7th of May, and we set a number of clinics up where we had diagnostic uh, emissions and ABR uh, available. A lot of the backlog did happen to be well baby unilaterals, so fortuitously, uh, in a lot of cases, we were able to sort of discharge on diagnostic emissions, but we had things set up so that if we were unable to get clear responses on emissions, then there was a second audiologist available to then take them in and, and undertake ABR if needed. Uh, and I think we only needed to actually do that on two cases. So we cleared the backlog by the 30th of May, you know, and that just that excludes the, the six cases that declined. Um, new cases, we're, we're now seeing you know, well within the uh, NH2 framework. Um, I've estimated that yeah, for this quarter, the, our NH2 performance will probably be down to about 55%. Um, we've pre previously met the 95% the criteria, but you know, PHE expect there to be a hit uh, on um, 
uh, on H2. So where we are still providing face-to-face -face appointments, so it's fairly small numbers, you know, just those urgent cases that uh, I've described. You know, we escort the, you know, the patient from the car reception straight to the room, wherever possible, one parent. Okay, we, we, we have to um, follow our PPE guidance. The approach that we take is, in general, we can maintain social distancing within the department. We have set up a, a one-way system um, which required a bit of negotiation with uh, ECG in the corridor next door. Um, you, you can have your own interpretation of negotiation there, but anyway, we've got a one-way system now. So actually the approach we take is when we collect the um, patient uh, parents you know, we socially distance, we're not wearing PPE when we collect them, we take them straight into the room, uh, maintaining social distancing, we use just our large rooms so we can maintain that, uh, and we actually then do the history and briefing without a mask, um, enabling lip breeding, um, so that's not a barrier, and then we will uh, uh, don the appropriate PPE. And I think one of the other advantages of this is that, you know, it gives the parents confidence that, you know, actually PPE is being used sensibly and it's not being inappropriately used between patients. Clearly, if there's a diktat that says masks need to be worn all of the time, um, then, you know, we will adopt that. But that has worked actually, you know, pretty well um, here. So other aspects of face-to-face -face arrangements, you know, you know, appropriate decontamination between patients, you know, focusing on hard services, equipment and so on. You know, our infection control people are, are actually less, don't have as much concern um, regarding fabrics and carpets. Yeah, yes, you need to take sort of sensible uh, precautions, but certainly there seems to have been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, what needs to happen with, you know, uh, the fabric in soundproof rooms and carpets and, yeah, people uh, having to cover their rooms in, in plastic and so on. Uh, you have to be guided by the advice um, that, that you're given, but I think it's important that we you, you maintain the focus on those important things, which is hand washing, you know, hard surfaces and equipment. You know, it's hard surfaces where the evidence is the virus tends to survive longest. So, yeah, I think you can spend a lot of time worrying about uh, fabric and carpets and so on. and and my concern would be if that then took you right off the ball of uh, some of the other thing, things such as you know, hard services. So we only do the, you know, the bare essentials. We minimise the use of toys uh, when we've needed to do um, a, a play or VRA type uh, procedure. Previously, we've, we've not done it in the, the current, episode, uh, current episode, but previously we had used a setup where we had a third video screen to act as uh, a way of bringing the child's attention back to the front so that we could do it with, with one person. We've not needed um, to use that thus far, but that is something that we would probably um, use if we, if we needed to start doing more uh, VRA. It, we, we've used insert phones. It's been the default in the department for, for 20 years. Um, so that's what we use either with phone tips or with bowls. It avoids the issue of headphone covers and, and decontamination and it's, and, and it's not um, presented any particular issues. So we've, we've continued to offer urgent hearing assessment as normal, so sudden post meningitic, uh, and also some urgent face to face hearing aid provision. So essentially, um, preschoolers who were in process for receiving amplification or who needed uh, urgent ear mold impressions, which couldn't be managed by remote care or by um, scanning um, rebuilds. Uh, sorry, rebuilding molds from existing scans. In terms of remote provision, we use Attend Anywhere, uh, and that's that's worked you know, pretty well. Um, we use screen sharing, so that means that you can stick um, uh, uh, Little Ears, Peach, LSQ, or Life as appropriate. Yeah, we can run that on our patient management scene, uh, system, so it's on screen, uh, and that, you know, that can work quite well in capturing that information. We set a triage questionnaire up on our patient management system, uh, which I'll just show a, a slide in a moment about that. We've been making increased hearing aids with remote assist technology. So, you know, we, we've used, uh, well, 
or using or starting to use GN Ambios and, and Oticon uh, uh, open play aids um, because you then do have that remote assist facility. Uh, if you're doing all of this, um, and if some of you have been here, you will have to fill in the uh, DPI A uh, impact assessment forms, which are a great joy. Um, so be prepared to spend a bit of time doing those and be nice to your IT and information governance staff. I think the other thing to say as well is, you know, we've, you know, we've always used an RECD approach. E you know, we don't revert to in situ REA um, at a particular age. We we've always stored used RECDs and the advantage of RECDs is that you can always you know, build a new prescription pretty much from scratch if you've got that saved on your system. So this was just a questionnaire that we set up on a patient management system. It's just sort of fairly bog standard, you know, collecting information. We were using this for uh, new referrals to prioritise them, you know, for monitoring appointments, including those uh, for glue here, um, but also you know, hearing aid reviews, both for PCHI and also where we are managing glue here. Um, we also we used other questionnaires as well to get a bit bit more information. So little ears, for example, people have mentioned already. Uh, next slide. And really, the outcome of that was to to actually see what what can we safely do. You know, um, does does this individual need an urgent face to face? Do they need a face to face when we're able to provide it safely? Can we safely defer for three months? or six months if it's, a, if it's a planned hearing aid review, for example, and we've addressed any immediate concerns and there's no evidence of any sort of change uh, in, in hearing levels, for example. We can also uh, then include uh, work out the priority and you know, also the test method and whether we need ear specific. So the reason for this is to collect as much information so that if we do have to bring the patient in for a face-to-face -face time, we can make the best use of that time or keep keep that appointment as short as possible. Hopefully we've got uh, a fairly targeted, focused idea uh, of what we need to do. So the key messages, um, be guided by science or follow the science. That seems to be, a lot of people seem to be saying that, but, but that is the case and th there is a lot to take in. Um, about what we should be doing and you know, sifting out what is the important stuff, um, you know, the science. Stay focused on the important issues. You know, there's a lot of talk of PPE and a lot of discussion about infection control around booths. You know, social distancing is you know, probably the most important thing. Uh, and you know, that's certainly all, always at the, the forefront of my mind. Uh, and linked to that, you know, there are issues about um, waiting area capacity. Even if you use things like getting uh, taking patients straight in or you're making use of uh, off-site uh, facilities, you know, the waiting area capacity is going to be an issue. Um, we had um, seating for around about 60 patients uh, and that's for us ENT, Oral and Maxfax uh, and that's down to about 10 or 12 uh, seats. So that that is always going to be a limiting factor. I mean we we feel we could safely see more patients but we can't because of those kind of issues. The speed at which you can do things is also dependent on um, your your local trust and all I would say is don't get disheartened. You, know, you, you may hear that some services seem to be moving forward um, you know, very quickly or at different speeds. Don't get disheartened by that. You, you have to work within your existing framework and some of those things might be outside of your control. You can do everything Thing you can to influence, for example, the, the advisor, clinical advisory group, but ultimately a lot of this are, are down to, to trust uh, decisions. Uh, targets are targets. Um, I know how many diagnostic breaches I'll be reporting in June, and it's a very big number. Um, I've mentioned NH2 as well. Um, as far as I'm aware, DMO1 and uh, the uh, newborn screening targets continue to be monitored, although allowance apparently is going to be made for the COVID-19 situation. But you know, targets are targets. Yeah, we need to focus on you know, providing good, safe care. And I think the final thing is, you know, don't take shortcuts. I mean, I've been involved uh, in the uh, working group advising PHE, and certainly one of the issues that came up there where you know, some services seem to be um, providing a very, very good NH2 compliance. Um, actually, it transpired that the clock was being stopped inappropriately 
uh, by a telephone consultation instead of doing a, an assessment on a baby. So I think we need to make sure that you know, we, we understand you know, if there is good practice that it's shared, but also you know, we don't you know, slip into you know, perhaps adopting practice which isn't entirely uh, clinically appropriate. Thanks very much and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ed. That's great. We've got a couple of questions about PPE, actually. So um, someone says, uh, is Adam Beckman says the mask will last for four hours, but it can't be reused once it's been taken off. So are you getting through a lot of PPE? Is his question. Um, we so when we use we use the PPE in the manner that I've described there. So we are we are it's when we're doing that, that is for single use. So it is then it's changed between patients. So, for example, when um, you know, we were doing the joint uh, diagnostic emissions and uh, ABR clinics, you know, basically we had four in a session. So that's four lots of PPE. There are other occasions where staff might be wanting to wear PPE um, if they cannot maintain social distancing with other staff colleagues. Uh, and, uh, on, and in that case, it would be worn on a sessional basis. So, you know, for the four hours, or unless it was touched um, or became moist or, or damaged. The same as a lot of other trusts, you know, we, we had not audiology staff, but other staff wandering around in PPE, you know, in, all over the hospital, wandering around with the mask, but being worn around the neck. And that's, that's not appropriate use of PPE, and you're probably spreading stuff rather than containing it. So hopefully we've taken a sensible approach to that. And we've never Great. had any particular issues with PPE supply either. Great. Lovely, Ed. Thanks very much. Um, that's that's great. Especially I like what, what you said about the distraction um, using the video for VRA to keep them distracted to the centre. And I think that's something that we might be talking about a bit more. Um, so next we've got Veronica Kennedy. Are you there, Veronica? I am. Um, oh, great. Think... Thank you. So a lot of what I would have said has already sort of been said before. So my talk's a little shorter, but hopefully just looking at different angles. We certainly, if we go on the next slide, as Ed was saying, you know, we've got our 400 children that we'd already cancelled that we need to fit in somewhere. We're continuing to get new referrals that still have to be put in. And there's the old clock that Ed mentioned as well. Um, so, yeah, it's crazy times, isn't it? But we've sort of had a a way of coping and saying what we basically have to do is that we need to be reducing that workload that we need to see but when we are reducing it we need to make sure we've got a fail safe we have from the school screen point of view decided that anybody who failed on say five and one we were just going to send the parents a letter and say if you're worried get in touch um there we would frequently get paediatric referrals for can we have a test just because we haven't had one for ages. So we've had a discussion with them to say no. But obviously where you have the paediatricians referring in saying this is a child with speech and language delay, they still have to be seen, but they're going to be seen way down the list of the priority of those where there's actually concerns about hearing. From the review point of view, if this is where the telephone consultations come in. If you phone a parent, and we know from previous notes that maybe they were just down a little bit last time. So while our weather hasn't quite been as good as the Kent side of things, it's not been too bad. You would expect a lot of the glue ears to have resolved by now. So if there was very little or no parents concerned, then we would say, you know, we'll leave them be for now. And if there's any worries, get in touch. But it is that fail safe that parents need to say if they do develop concerns to get in touch. We all know parents, though, with whom they will say they have huge concerns about the children and the children are fine or the children who we know have a hearing loss and the children, the parents will go, no, no, they're fine. So you can't always rely on parental perception, but it's all we've got to go on for now. The next group of children were the ones that we thought we could defer until we were in a, a better space, if you like. So those who were coming up for their six month or annual checks around this time and they've got a stable hearing loss, then those were ones that we thought, having discussed with parents, that we could defer those ones for the next six months or 12 months that they would have been due. Or the older hearing aided children. And one of our fail safes with the hearing aided children is that we have a really good relationship with our teachers of the deaf. 
So we have had frequent consultations with the teachers of the deaf and then we would be running through the children because they're also keeping in touch with them. And then after that, that comes down to, well, who are we actually going to see on a face-to-face -face side of things? I would have to say, though, that you have to be wary about not telephoning, saying to the parents, we're just phoning up to have a chat, um, that it actually is a consultation. And where you're giving advice or where you're, you're telling about different strategies or giving that fail-safe to say you can opt in, they do need to be sent letters at the end so it isn't just a tick in their notes to say we've done it. They do need to be managed as proper clinical encounters. Um, there is the concern that we could miss things or the parents could miss things and that they have a way in if they should develop concerns with it. So on to the next slide. So we're coming then to what's our recovery plan. So once we've gone through those, we can triage a little bit, having contacted parents and say there is that one's about your parental um, level of how well they can judge their children. Outcome measure, th I think, is a really good idea. But again, the outcome measures aren't always suitable for all our populations of children. So, for example, in Peach, there's a question about saying, can your child follow simple instructions to do a simple task? I would be a millionaire if I bet a penny every time my child did not do a simple instruction to a simple task, and that had nothing to do with their hearing. So the questions aren't always around hearing. So some of them can be around general development or language development. Some of the ICA measures like the LSQ is really quite pictorial. Uh, pictorial. So it's hard to describe that over the phone. Uh, but you know, Pete and Little Ear certainly do have questions that, that are worth looking at. We have a quite a large Asian population, so we don't have many of our staff members who speak Urdu, for example. And you've got to think if you're going to be phoning them up, whether you're going to be linking in with an interpreter, whether they will have an interpreter who's going to be available to then do a three-way consultation on the phone, or if you're going to do it on a video side of things. Um, there was uh, the only app, and I'm really looking forward to what Anissa comes up at the end, that I could see that had been used in children when I did a lit search was EarScale. And when I downloaded it, I couldn't really make a lot of sense out of trying to do the different settings on it. So it's not one that I would really be recommending, but that could just be me doing it. Um, there are a number of different modes then with regard to the, we're on the, the, the previous slide still, um, with regard to the virtual side of things. And of course, you can use the virtual side either for triaging. And what we're doing currently is we'll send a letter to the children who would have had appointments to opt into a telephone or a virtual consultation. So that if you have a family who need lip reading facilities, then they can do that consultation virtually. And I think a lot of people in this current climate are used to Skype and Zoom and things like that. So it is quite a common thing to do. Um, attend anywhere is quite is quite a useful thing to do. It's a little bit more formal in that you have people in a virtual waiting room that you have to connect to, but you can connect to a two-way system on that as well if you did want um, the teacher of the deaf linking into that. We've done it in a WebEx call. Uh, we had done a really good trial run with the teacher of the deaf and us virtually. We were socially distancing in our clinic room with our wide angle lens for the, the webcam so that you could see everybody. And we had a little meeting. And of course, we tried it the next day with the parents and my video cam just kept buffering. It wouldn't wouldn't connect. So we could end up hosting the meeting and then we were phoning into the meeting. And the mum who doesn't have um, great hearing and is reliant on lip reading, we were having to go through the teacher virtually to then say to things to the parents. So. It can work well when it works, but there's also hiccups when it doesn't. So back to the, the virtual side of it, you also have to have families who can do it. And we have quite a, a um, low socioeconomic groups within Bolton where they wouldn't have the access to that. Some of them don't have enough credit on the phone to be getting telephone consultations, never mind having access to sort of broadband and Wi-Fi's and things. Um, but you also then have that thing about the advantage of being able to perhaps engage with a child or if you have other children in the family 
where we normally have written a letter to say, you know, parents saying, please only bring one child and they come in with seven more in tow. At least you can, um, not literally, but lock the others in the room while you have this consultation virtually and you haven't actually left them with anybody. So I think the virtual thing does have a lot of advantages and it is helpful for those who've got hearing losses and it's helpful for people who have normally to have taken two buses to get to see you, um, as well as sort of from the professional's point of view, you can sort of time manage different appointments. But there are issues and as Sam was saying, while it can be difficult getting them even on the telephone, it can also be difficult getting the children to engage with the um, with the camera side of it. But I think it is a useful tool to have. Uh, like everybody else has mentioned, we've certainly prioritized ABRs. We've had a number of sort of meningitis or encephalitis and sepsis that have come through. We've managed to restart to a degree. So all our hearing aided children's families have been contacted and we're now starting to see the preschoolers. Uh, obviously, because of PPE and just general, um, you've got to have that doffing and donning of your, the PPEs, you've got to try and engage the child and we've so far had quite a few funny looks when they come in and you're there in your full PPE'd up um, garb. So it takes a little bit more time to engage with them. And then you've also got more time between appointments because of cleaning. And as Ed was saying, you do have that overlap of patients in the waiting room. So we can control ours and we can stagger ours, but we can't stagger it with everybody else who's working in that waiting room corridor. So that does make it more challenging. Um, it's also difficult communicating behind a mask. So where we can, we've been using visors just it's not quite within the PPE guide because some of them you do have to be within your two meters. But for our deaf families, we've thought at least that's giving more protection and we've gone with the visors rather than the face masks for those ones. So we're on to our new day that's supposed to be dawning sometime. And I'm not sure when we're going to get around to doing sort of our routine cases, but we're just trying to, at the moment, get on top of all the ones who should have been seen, who weren't seen and then those urgent ones. But it is just being aware that are we missing something we shouldn't and to make sure that parents are aware that if they've got concerns, they can phone in. We can sort of reprioritize children as needed. And that's it. Oh, that's lovely, Veronica. Thanks very much indeed. We don't have any specific questions, um, but there might be some as the chat goes on and we will send them to you, Veronica, so that you can answer them. Okay. So the one next we're going to talk a little bit about bone anchored hearing devices because this came up a lot on the survey that we did that a lot of people wanted to know about pathways so this is going to be adult pathways and this is what they're doing in Chester so we've got Jane and Sarah on the line I hope yeah hi can you hear me okay yeah we can hear you Jane lovely um so just a, a quick overview for me and then I'll pass on to Sarah because she's done all the hard work with the Baja pathways so um we've been looking at a few different areas of our service for remote working um I think some of the, the areas of our service lend themselves more easily to remote working than others um but this part of the um the the sort of the webinar we, we're looking been asked to talk about the the Baja pathways that we've been doing um I would say in terms of our areas of service probably the, the the first one we started was the tinnitus which I talked about on the last uh, remote working webinar a couple of weeks ago um, adult rehab we've done quite a lot of work with remote working on that as well um, less so with the pediatrics I think that's already been discussed in quite a lot of detail today um, and a little bit with the balance but we have done quite a lot of work well, Sarah has done quite a lot of work on on the Baja remote working pathways so um, I'll hand over to her um, just to talk you through those in a bit more detail Hello, Sarah, can you hear us? I think her microphone's off at the moment. I'll just go over a minute. She might come back again. OK, can you hear me? Yeah, we can do. Yeah. Great. Uh, that's fine. OK, afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, uh, with regard to, our, our, we're quite a big Baja service and we, ha we had to cancel uh, a large number of patients within different appointment types. And what we've managed to do actually with regard to the Baja process or pathway is incorporate 
remote working into um, several of those appointment types. Now, it's not removed the need for those appointment types, it's just supplemented them or um, moving them along in the process. So we have done remote working within the new assessments, within post-home trial reviews, initial fits, follow-ups and repairs. Um, so what I was going to do is just take you through the pathways for each of those appointments, just so you can see where we are using remote working. So new assessments, so uh, we, what happens with new assessments in our trust is they are referred into ENT, but they come to see us first. So what we've been doing is we've been reviewing the referrals and requesting the notes from their local service. So this would include what sort of hearing aids they'd had, um, their audio, uh, any up-to-date information. And um, what we would do is we'd send out uh, a letter, uh, a, a brochure, which would outline a bit of information about Baja and a, a questionnaire that we would usually complete with them at that first assessment appointment. We would then speak to them to make sure that they are happy to engage in that. Um, and we've been very lucky that the majority of patients are very keen to engage. Um, and we have arranged either an appointment through um, the video system or on the phone to take them through uh, a part of the assessment process. So what we do at that point um, when we've booked that in for them is we would review their questionnaire and when we talk a little bit more about Baha, show them what it what it is, um, how it works, a, a bit about the process that's involved and what would happen going forward. Um, and once we've done that, the patient is then added um, to a waiting list for the second part of the assessment, which would be the testing and the trial um, of the device, because obviously that's not something we, we are able to do remotely. Um, another area we have been focusing on is the initial fits. And these patients, we've had a number of patients who had the surgery back in sort of quite a quite a few months ago back earlier in the year and they are very keen um, to get their hands on their bar heart so um, we had to be very careful with this and it was a discussion that was undertaken with our lead clinician in ENT about if he would be happy to do this um, and what we have done is we've reviewed those patients and contacted them to check how they've been getting on with their abutment site, how they've been managing cleaning, and if they would be happy to do a virtual fitting if they want to get their Baja um, set up in that way or whether they prefer to wait. And actually the majority of them prefer to go ahead. And what we have asked them to do um, is to um, download two apps. And one of the apps is, we fit cochlear Baja's majority of the time, so one of the apps is the control so that they can make changes to the volume and also um, programs. But another app that we've asked them to download is the Ponto uh, Care app, which is something that is supporting us through their fitting process. So obviously they can't get in to see us, so we need them to be more engaged in the process and that app uh, helps us to do that. Um, we obviously explain we'll send the pack out to them with um, relevant information, the Baja and the accessory, but we ask them not to use it um, until they've had their, until we've got their virtual appointment and we do that quite quickly after we've got confirmation that we've got it. So, oh, back, back with it. Um, so the virtual appointment takes place um, over um, our Fleming, uh, accurate, uh, the Fleming system that we use and we will review their abutment site at that process and explain, go through what we would normally do on a fitting appointment. Um, if, it, if, for instance, it, it's not working, patient is struggling, obviously it can be put to one side and we can bring them in when we can. Um, but what we're doing with the Ponto care app is asking them to monitor their abutment site and there's also a diary in there for them to monitor their uh, progress with it which we will review we will review when we see them when we contact them virtually again four weeks later next slide please um we've managed to with regard post home trial review so this is patients who were uh, who have had it on trial we've managed to um do a lot of this remotely um some of these patients have been able to be discharged because either they decided that it's not something that they want to proceed with or 
um, they do want to proceed and it is forwarding on um, to ENT. Some of them have needed to be put on waiting lists to come in for appointments. Um, for those who have decided to go ahead, they've either returned their Baja or they've kept the demo one until they will come in for their ENT appointment. Next slide, please. Uh, Follow-up appointments have been quite easy to manage when, when people are getting on quite well and, and we have been able to discharge patients to repairs. Obviously, we never discharge them fully. They can contact us as and when they need to if they're having problems, um, but it's just touching base with them so that they can act they can ask any questions they may have and we can help them by sending out accessories and information if it's needed or if there are problems we can onward refer or get them in touch with the ENT um, so it's helping keep that continuity with them next slide please uh, another area and the repair is obviously the Baja repairs and and this is is where people are can be really desperate now this is our standard process that we are using as part of um, a pilot scheme that we're doing. But at the moment, um, up until the end of May, Cochlear were actually um, sending the devices out before they had them back. So we would still speak to the patient, ensure that there wasn't anything that we could do to fix the device and that it needed to go back for repair. We would send um, a copy of the NOAA file to Cochlear so they could put the settings on and we would fill in a form outlining the, the issues for Cochlear. They would set up the Baja and post it back to the patient with a, a self-addressed envelope to send their replacement, their, their faulty aid back to Cochlear. So that's something that, that they introduced during this pandemic to help with that. But going forward, the device will have to come into the department, but the, it, we will still follow that process in the fact that the cochlear will send the device directly to them, which makes it a lot quicker for them getting their repaired device back. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, the remote working has allowed us to, because we have so many appointments um, that we had to cancel, it's allowed us to reduce the appointment lengths for some of those appointments when they come in. So the patients aren't going to need to be in the clinic as long and we can potentially see more people within the clinical time that we have available. And it has eliminated the face-to-face -face appointments for some patients and not delayed their journey. So that, that's that been really helpful. Um, also with Baja patients, they often have to travel a long way. So they've quite liked being able to do this if, if things have been going quite well and, and there's not, not much that they need to go through. And I think with more product development with regard to remote programming, remote working is going to feature much more in, in the service delivery of the bar heart, well, in our service delivery, um, because it is much easier for patients who are a bit, who are distant from the department. Um, if anyone wants any information on any of those, because it was a bit of a whistle top tour, then, then you feel free to email me. Or if you have That's any great, questions. Sarah. Thank you. We've had quite a good chat actually on the chat about Bahas. Um, so we'll make sure that we share that with everybody. There was one question: Have you done a Baha MDT virtually? Uh, no, no, we haven't. Um, that's something that we have got an ENT spec meeting next week. So that's something that will uh, potentially come up at, at that meeting because obviously okay. we're going to be presenting a lot more of these things that we've been doing because we are going to need to incorporate this in our working going forward. Okay, that's lovely. So we probably had enough content today for about two hours of, of webinar, but luckily the rest of the content is very suitable to be posted online. So Anissa from Mancad's done a lovely summary of all the different apps and how they work, and she's going to record that and do some demos with it as well, and we'll post that online. We've got some survey results from some of the surveys that have been going around to see what current practice is, and again, we can post those online. Um, so we're going to leave it here today because I don't want to keep anyone. We don't have another webinar planned. Uh, the next step is to look back at the documents that we produce and to see how we could update them and revise them. So if anyone's got any comments or suggestions about what they want from these documents, how they want them to look, the content they want in them, then please do get in touch with Gabby and I so that we can make sure that they're actually usable and useful. 
and that's it thank you very much to everyone that contributed thanks to all the speakers um, and thanks to everyone for joining us today have a nice weekend